I want to thank you again for joining us today, proclaiming justice to the nations. For those of you who are not familiar with PJTN, our mission is to educate Christians about their biblical responsibility to stand with our Jewish brethren and defend the state of Israel against the rise of global anti-Semitism. We accomplish that, that mission by producing award-winning documentary films and television programs, distributing our media to over 200 nations, reaching over 2 billion potential viewers through all of our media partners and platforms. So we couldn't do it without the support of so many of you who support PJTN financially, so we want to thank you for that as well. Today's topic, as I said, is going to deal with the issue of Christian anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we live at a time when we are witnessing the rise of anti-Semitism, which is unprecedented globally in general, but more specifically to the United States of America. I just returned from South Africa back in November. And South Africans, as many of you know, 80% of South Africans are Christians. However, Durban, or the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement came out of South Africa under the watchful eye of Christians, Christian leaders, Christian denominations, and it never went challenged. We were invited by our new PJTN chapter leaders to come and speak to the church in South Africa. And my message to each one of the leaders was the same as the message that I speak to Christian leaders here in the United States of America. They live in a Judeo-Christian nation, much like what we do here in the United States of America. And unfortunately, because they did not speak up, anti-Semitism has grown within mainline denominations and even evangelical denominations. And it's extremely unfortunate because we as Christians, especially those who are evangelical, should know better. We should know that God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants forever. That covenant, that contract that God made, did not end at the birth of Jesus Christ or at his passing when he died and rose. It didn't end in 2000 or on 9-11. It didn't end in this 2020, the year 2020. That covenant is everlasting. And if we as Bible-believing Christians are going to honor the text of Scripture and honor God's covenant, then we too should be standing with Israel. And we too should be condemning anti-Semitism and replacement theology that fuels it. And the message I brought to the leaders in South Africa, I said to them, how, how could you sit back? How could you allow a violation of the Ninth Commandment by allowing a false testimony or a false witness to be given about Israel, accusing Israel of being an apartheid state? Israel is not an apartheid state. And I said to them, if anybody knows apartheid, you do. And I said to them, you know, it's interesting because I went to Pretoria and I went to the Museum of the Apartheid and you know what I found amazing in the museum was a picture of Jewish women, 20,000 Jewish women and South Africans who were protesting the apartheid movement. And I said to them, you know what it reminded me of is here in the United States who was marching in the streets of Selma, Alabama with our, bl our black um, brothers and sisters? It wasn't the white Christian evangelical or mainline churches. It was the Jewish community. And I said, how could you sit back and not speak? And when the, my, my statement was over, we opened up for Q&A and I thought, these leaders are gonna tell me thank you very much and never invite me back. But I heard quite the opposite. 
they admitted that they were silent. And they admitted that they wanted to reverse the course. And I said to them, if you look at what's happening around the world, the rise of anti-Semitism, what is fueling it? It's the BDS movement. Listen to all the commentary. Read the articles. They always blame Jews for occupying Palestinian land. God made a covenant with the descendants of Ishmael, and he said that they will have land east of Canaan, but they've never been satisfied with their lot. They want Canaan. God gave Canaan to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants forever. And that covenant will never end. When the Messiah returns, he will be sitting on his throne in Jerusalem. And we as Christians, if we do not understand that if we remove Israel, then we can easily, the next to be removed is Christianity. And we see it, those of you who follow PJTN, you know about the battle that we've been fighting to fight anti-Semitism and this propaganda in our children's textbooks and curriculum throughout the country. But South Africa and Australia and the other Western countries have the same problem as well. So we are here to inform and educate each one of you to give you the tools and the information so that you can take this message to your sphere of influence as well. I want to introduce to you our first panelist. It's a great honor to have my sister in the Lord with me here because she is also a mentor to me. Jan Markell will be honored as the recipient of PJTN's 2020 Tree of Life Award. Jan is a leading voice in support of Israel from her platform of veteran national radio broadcaster. Her weekly program, Understanding the Times, is heard on over 900 radio stations in the U.S. as well as globally on internet broadcast. Her Understanding the Times teaching conference held in Minnesota is the world's largest Christian prophecy event, annually attracting thousands of attendees. She is the author of eight books, and she is a regular guest at conferences and events across America. Her topic today will address prophecy and the rise of anti-Semitism. Jan, the floor is yours. I uh, flew down, I literally landed about 25 minutes ago and uh, noticed I think I'm the only one with a winter coat here because I came from Minnesota. So um, just so you know that uh, we still have a bitter winter up there. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, I began working uh, with Lori some few years ago and had her at my fall conference this last September and uh, just a word of uh, kind of a observation is that, and she shared uh, about a half an hour, and honestly, my audience did not know probably 90% of what she shared. I mean, they were stunned. So this is a ministry that's needed. It's a ministry that needs to be supported. Let me just say this, that we're talking about churches today, I think, and we're talking about how the message that this ministry represents is received today. And I've been ministering in the churches for, well, almost three, uh, four decades. And when I started doing that, I, I, I just want to say that the, the reception was phenomenal. If I had wanted to, I could have ministered easily seven days a week in the churches and been received with the message that this ministry represents. Mine is heavily eschatology, end time events. Jesus is returning, etc. But you can't talk about that without talking about the miracle, not of the 20th century, the miracle of all time, the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Promised in the Bible and fulfilled in the 20th century. And the churches loved to hear it. And then over the years, starting probably 20 years ago, this began to fall off and die down and I would have to say as I speak today other than a few select churches throughout the western world particularly North America there's a little bit of interest but 
Um, I think what's replaced the kind of interest that I saw as I was starting out now is there's a passion for social justice. And when you start talking about social justice, you're going to hear the not just the mainline churches, but even the evangelical church say, but, but, the, but the Palestinians are the persecuted, and we've got to be looking out for the persecuted because of this new love and interest, this new mantra of social justice. And so the, the picture today is 100% flipped in the church, in the church. Now I'm talking mainly evangelical. Even though every evangelical will read uh, Ezekiel 37, the rebirth of the dry bones, and as I said, a few years ago would have been so excited about that because we've seen it happen. Today it's kind of a, kind of a yawn. It's kind of a, oh well, we're not quite as interested as we used to be. And um, about uh, 10 years ago, and I went to Bethel College in St. Paul, graduated from there, and, and, but 10 years ago, uh, Bethel hosted what's known as Hope for the Holy Land. Now you'd think that's a real positive sounding event at my alma mater. No, it was basically a bash Israel for two hour session. And those of us in the audience who tried to raise our hands and speak truth into the event were shut down. Now this is the, one of the primary evangelical colleges in America, Bethel College, just 10 years ago. And then at the end of that, the president of the college got up and, and, and said, and I'm paraphrasing, I was raised in a home that was totally pro-Israel and I'm so sad that I wasn't raised in a home that was more pro-Palestinian. This is Bethel College in St. Paul, Minnesota in 2009. And I realized we have a serious problem in the church. And if we can't get this kind of a message, the kind of message PJTN is trying to convey, the, talking about this, this stunning rise of anti-Semitism, shocking rise of anti-Semitism, if we can't get this into the evangelical church and get the evangelical church concerned about this, I'm not sure that a lot can be accomplished without the evangelical church throwing their weight in and being a part of ministries like this, and like mine as well. But you see, the church growth movement came along 20 years ago and everything changed, everything changed. So that's just a little bit of a, of a you know, five minute scenario of what's happened in the last 35 to 40 years where um, everything has, the pulpits are now silent. The pulpits, we were just walking up here, I was talking with a PJN, T, a PJTN staff person here about the churches even in this area, because the, the pulpits are now silent about so much that's important, so that people who are really hungry don't know where to go any longer, and particularly where to go to find out, to learn about issues of the day and how they relate to the Bible, to learn about, <laughs> about what's happening in Israel, to learn what's happening how, with the Jewish people. You're just not going to hear it from today's pulpit, and this is a this is a huge change in my lifetime. It's a shocking change, and I'm just sounding an alarm. I'm sounding an alarm wherever I can go that we need to pray for our churches that they would start to turn, go back to the, the days when they would talk about things that mattered and have a burden for things that matter. And honestly, if the nation of Israel doesn't matter to the church anymore, or if it's in lesser importance than it was. 20, 30, 40, 100 years ago, we got a problem, evangelicals. We got a serious problem. I have a question I just want to ask you. <clears throat> if you could be more specific, what changes have you seen in the world and more importantly in the church in the last 40 years pertaining to this issue? Because I hear what you're saying. That's been one of the problems that we've had, even, um, for example, Bible Bethlehem College. Yes, exactly. Would you um, speak to that issue? Because that's one of the culprits of what's yeah. promoting that narrative that you're talking well, about. Well, the narrative is that we must, we, I'm, I'm not talking about anybody here, but I'm talking about the mood in the church today is the new burden is for the Palestinians. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be carrying and sharing the gospel with Palestinian people, they, absolutely. But the burden that evangelicals once had for the, for 
first of all, the excitement that Israel came back to life 70, almost 72 years ago is now overshadowed because the evangelical church is focusing on, again, social justice, therefore we must have a burden more for the Palestinian. Remember, honestly, folks, there's no such thing as a Palestinian. I mean, Yasser Arafat was an Egyptian, so this is an invented people, but the, but, but the church, Lori's taken its focus off the Jews and put it on the Palestinians. That's the evangelical church. I can't speak for the main line, but I suspect they're doing the very same thing. My concern is the evangelicals, because at one time, Ezekiel 37, the dry bones coming to life, was one of the most exciting messages the evangelical church could hear and preach. And today, it's ho-hum. <clears throat> So one of the things that I hear quite often from evangelical Christians is that the poor Palestinians are being persecuted, but they don't know who, or they say that, right. that the, the people that are persecuting them are the Israelis. However, since Oslo, since 1993, the Palestinian Authority has governed the affairs That's right. of cities like Bethlehem. Could you talk about that, Jan, about how Christians, over 80% of the Christians, fled Bethlehem? Yes, I have worked with Pastor Steve Curry of um, the Baptist Church there in Bethlehem, and, and he has a wonderful outreach, believe it or not, to Jews, Muslims, believers, unbelievers. but. Bethlehem is unrecognizable. I mean, at one time it was the hub of lots of activity in Israel, but because the Palestinian Authority has moved in there and has chased out just about everybody other than Pastor Steve Curry's church, which is a solid evangelical pro-Israel um, outreach that they have right there in the heart of Bethlehem, um, it, it is unrecognizable, and, and what a shock. When I was there last in, I think it was in the early to mid 80s, um, it was a booming town with Christians, Jews, Muslims, but then this Pal the Palestinian Authority has moved in, taken over, and now it's unrecognizable. So, I mean, this is a tragedy of tragedies. It, it, it really is, I mean. But again, the emphasis has all gone on the cause of the Palestinian people. Well, what about, <laughs> Bible, the, what the Bible says about the Jews, the Bible doesn't speak about the Palestinians. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. <clears throat> yeah, that's been one of the problems that we've seen. We produced the documentary. Some of you may be yeah. familiar with the Boycott This documentary where we actually went and interviewed Arabs, Muslim and Christian. And the narrative that they were communicating was not the same narrative that we hear from people like Mahmoud Abbas and his leadership. Why do you think, Jan, we are not hearing from the Christian church relative to these people? Because we do know that the Christians have been persecuted. I don't know, Lori. I just think that there's been a, a propaganda job that's, again, I'm going back to this hope for the Holy Land, which was even the title is bizarre. They didn't offer any hope. The participants, I mean, let me tell you who the participants were in this hope for a holy land. And then I, I hope it'll answer your question indirectly anyway. The participants in this hope for the holy land seminar at Bethel College included World Vision, and they spent an hour and a half doing nothing but bashing and hammering Israel. Lynn Hybels, who has, is respected in the evangelical community, even though her replacement theology has blinded her and her husband to the importance of the Jewish people. And do you have any idea the influence that the Hybels have had in the last 40 years on evangelical Christianity? Huge influence, huge influence. And uh, then there was a third element, and that would have been the Awads, who are from Bethlehem, Sammy Awad, these three made up a traveling almost circus, if I can be so blunt, going from college to college to church to college to church across North America, doing exactly what I saw at my alma mater for an hour and a half, and that is maligning Israel, misrepresenting Israel, and lying about Israel. 
And again, those of us in the audience who knew the truth tried to speak up, and we were, we were literally shut down. We couldn't, we couldn't get two words out because they knew we were there to, def to give the truth and defend Israel. So you take this whole new mood and throw it into the evangelical church, and suddenly you've got tens of millions of Christians who 30 years ago were pro-Israel. Now they're wobbly, now they're shaky, now they don't know quite what to believe. You've got Lynn Hybels saying that, that Israel persecutes the Jews. Well, don't we all respect Lynn Hybels? I'm just speaking for the way people are receiving her message because I personally have a hard time with this woman when I heard the, the distortions that she was sharing at the so-called hope for the Holy Land. You know, I don't want to get carried away here, but this was at a leading evangelical college in America where I went to school at one time it, when it was solid, but this is the new mood in the church and in Christian colleges. What, are, what avenues are left to get the truth out? PJTN, Olive Tree Ministries, and a few ministries that are bold enough to speak above these people who are shouting the lies so that we can speak the truth. Thank you. Our next panelist, Dr. Sandra Alfonsi, recognized as an international expert on the educational terrorism that is presented to America's children within the U.S. educational system. And Dr. Fonzi, is, she recently moved to Israel in 2018, and she serves as a senior fellow of proclaiming justice to the nations. Dr. Alfonsi is going to address the topic of medieval Christian anti-Semitism and the Inquisition, the role Christianity played in influencing the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition. Please give a welcome round of applause to Dr. Sandra Alfonsi. Dr. Alfonsi, yes. do you see today signs of the same blood libel and caricatures that permeated the pre-Inquisition society? Definitely, and I think that uh, if we are oblivious to this, we are oblivious to the level of the anti-Semitism as it grows in the United States, the danger from it, because there would, be, there would have been no Inquisition without the Christian anti-Semitism, which we will go into. But all of the steps, all of the vocabulary, all of the caricatures of what it meant and what it means to be a Jew, what is wrong with us as Jews, how we do not fit into society, all of the imagery, all of the vocabulary, and the stereotypes are from day to day growing and they are inside of our churches, they are inside of the media, and they, if you look now internationally, you have to look only at the Easter, the parades that are going to be in, are in Belgium, that are in Holland, and that are now in Spain. And you look at the personification of the Jew as an insect. Yes. You look at the personification of the Jew as a pig. You look at the horrific personification of the Orthodox Jews, which now makes them the primary target the primary target of, uh, of terror, of abuse, both in the communities and around the world. So yes, I see definitely, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to say it, because we as Jews, my, I am Jewish, and I made Aliyah to Israel, and I live there, but as Jews, we are the first to blame for not raising the alarm. And it was an honor to be asked by Lori to come and join this organization. But the, what I'm saying is, yes, I do believe that that which we saw at the time of the Inquisition, we are seeing it again today. I was asked whether I think there will be another Holocaust. I really do not carry that language forward. The Holocaust, the Shoah, is the moment in history where extermination and the extinction of the Jewish people by Hitler, by the Nazis. It is a continuation of a cycle. So I do not look at this and project with the same vocabulary because I will not minimize the Shoah, the Holocaust, but I will not at the same time say that what we see now in the anti-Semitism is not the medieval Christian anti-Semitism which never went away, it was covered over, it has been made palatable and now by the, the combination 
of the medieval Christian anti-Semitism and Islamist anti-Semitism, there is a free-for-all in Jewish blood. And that is what I see, and I do believe that. Dr. Alfonsi, you do a lot of research for PJTN, and we are so grateful. Many of you are the recipients of that information on the context or the content in our children's K through 12 textbooks. We hear a lot about what's happening on our colleges and universities, the indoctrination of our children with the same rhetoric, the same propaganda, the same false ac accusation that Israel is an apartheid state. But can you share with our audience some of the content that you have found in reviewing our K through 12 curriculum here in the United States specifically? Uh, first of all, I will have to say honestly that the biggest honor in my life was coming and joining Lori because she allows me to speak and to write the truth of the work that I've been doing for 25 years. So the, 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 we say the kavod, all of the honor goes to Lori for allowing me to speak. What I see in our textbooks, what I've been doing over the past 20 to 25 years on our textbooks, comes to a culmination today, I like to say, inside the textbooks produced by Pearson Publishers. There is a parallel, and what we're looking at as Judaism as a world religion, what we're looking at at the falsification of the history of the state of Israel, what we're looking at at the elimination of the contributions of the Jewish people to American history, we find this over and over. And I want to say one thing which you have to understand looking at it, I, I'm a specialist in language and I, I pay a lot of attention to the language. We cannot say there were no Palestinians. That is the terminology of the region, and it will, that is a historical entity. When, when it, the name of Judeo was changed to Palestine, that is the terminology. There were the Jews who were the first Palestinians, but there are, you cannot, and I beg you not to rewrite a revision of history. There was an entire body of Arab population in the same land. Therefore, to deny that existence, what does not exist is the false creation of a Palestinian state. But you cannot, and I beg you not to, totally eradicate the, those who lived side by side in a land that the Roman Empire tried to destroy and disconnect completely from the fact that the Jews were there biblically. We cannot do the same thing. What we are fighting against is the false creation of a Palestinian state with, with borders. There, is, there has never been the desire for a two-state solution. It is a one-state solution that the, that the Arab League and all of this, these, these want. They want the eradication of Israel and they will, hopefully, it will not happen, but that will be the moment when the word Palestine comes into existence. But in the textbooks, and what Lori asked me the question about the college campus, this is a phenomenon. This, what we see in the textbooks, is not a trickle down from the college campus. This started in K through 12, 6th through 12th grade. It started in 1975 with the first billions of dollars put in by Saudi Arabia into our uh, education system here. And this is what you find the, the result in our textbooks. There, there is a marginalization. We have to understand that multiculturalism had a tremendous negative impact on our education system and it did not have the impact of multiculturalism which should have been equality and putting together in the textbooks all of the a way of developing our students to live in society. That did not take place. What we find in the textbooks today we find the, the, actually, there is the bias and slant on the Jews. There is a tremendous, and don't, and I'm saying this with a great deal of love, do not underestimate what is happening around the world with the genocide of the Christians, because if we study what is going on and we take the word globalization, this started in 1975 slowly with the impact of the 
of Saudi Arabian money, and that was to completely rewrite the history, to draw the division between, the, uh, between America, the politics, the State Department, and through education to sever the relationship between the United States and the State of Israel. And that, that has come to pass. Because if you wonder about a lot of the things that have happened in the Middle East to Israel, you have to go back to the politics of, the, of our State Department. And our State Department is virulently anti-Semitic, and it came through the money that was given, as an example, to Georgetown University. That's where the diplomats, our diplomats are trained. So these are the, these are the parallels that we find, and we find it today. And the other part is, that if you, re if you remove the identity of the Jews, you, you can't, you know, God forbid, we finish Hitler's work, all right? So, but if you remove from education the presence of the Jews, you remove from our education system how the Jews and the Christians in our country have interacted. Yes, over the years there have been anti-Semitism, there's been problems but the textbooks now have removed, and it isn't that they made a typographical error. They have removed the unification, the unity between the Jews and the Christians. And then they, that went on with our, and this is the question of the terminology. This did not start with the terminology African-American. It started with the black Americans, then the vocabulary of African-American came in, and now the blacks are taking back their identity and, and it is Caucasian and black. But what the textbooks have done, and it was, it is also part of the ancient, the medieval, the Christian anti-Semitism. They have brought the separation, a separation that was created with blood. And never forget, there was Jewish blood lost during the civil rights movement. There was, there was the second president of the NAACP was a Jew for 10 years. There was Jewish money, all of that, but there were three civil rights workers killed in Mississippi, college students, one black, James Cheney, and two Jewish college students who died side by side. Those three died side by side fighting for the, the civil rights. Now, if you look at our textbooks, that is what is being eradicated. It is the globalization and if you talk about globalization, there is one globalization. And this is what all of this is leading to. And when it's the globalization of Islam as the world religion, Pearson removed Judaism as a world religion. It was always Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, chronological order. And Pearson removed, we are no longer a world religion. We are in a category called others. Yes. Mm -hmm. But never forget, on the chopping block, you take off the Jews, you remove them out of the civilization, you remove them out of the textbooks, and you take them out of society. And then the next up on that line, and this should be a warning signal to you, the next up on the line are the Christians. And Pearson, Pearson is brilliant in its evil. I mean, it, it's exquisite. Thank you. Because what they do is they use they used adherence, the number of people. And the difference between the number of Christians and the number of Muslims is not large. Look at Christian, the genocide today. Look at ISIS, look at everything that is happening and look at the numbers it didn't seem a lot, you have 400 here, 1400 here. Mm -hmm. If you start counting and you put it together mm -hmm. and you look at reality, the reality is we lost six million Jews in the Holocaust. You go through from the Holocaust to now the numbers of generations lost, we lost a mm -hmm. lot more than six million. I'd like to welcome to the, the, po the panel Dr. Carol Swain. She is a Pulitzer Prize nominated author of The New White Nationalism in America. Dr. Swain is a former university professor of political science and law at Princeton and Vanderbilt universities. She is also nationally known as an in-demand political commentator seen often on Fox, 
ABC Headline News, CNN, BBC, BBC Radio, and others. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carol Swain. <laughs> Dr. Swain, your topic today is going to address the classic anti-Semitism in academia and how it is influencing a new generation of violence against Jews. So my question, how did academia influence anti-Semitism during the Nazi era and what are the similarities influencing anti-Semitism in academia today? Laurie, I prepared a presentation answering your question, but as I sat here and listened to the other two uh, presenters and your opening comments, I feel that there's something else I should talk about today. It seems like people are puzzled about why don't the Christian world, why don't they recognize what the Bible says about Israel? God gave the land to Abraham. What's going on? Can't they see that? Can't they see uh, Ezekiel? Can they see all of this? Well, I'm here to tell you that the intellectual church doesn't care because they have sort of reinterpreted the Bible. And when it comes to what's going on, what everyone is missing is that we're fighting the same enemy and it is cultural Marxism. It's a form of critical theory and what's taking place between whites and blacks in these diversity and inclusion offices, what's taking place at the universities, in business, the Christian academies, it's the same battle that the Jews are facing. And so you can't, um, you have to know your enemy and you'll never be able to reach the church or people in academia until you realize uh, their tactics and their techniques. And so they revise history and they use language. They use language very cleverly. And if you want to understand the cultural Marxism, then you have to do some reading. You have to go back and read some of the theorists, the cultural Marxists. You have to read Saul Alinsky. You have to uh, read uh, uh, Herbert Macusa. You have to read uh, some of these people. Uh, George Orwell's 1984, that was about revising history. Well, we're living that right now. And so what's taking place is the revision of language, history, and it's the same goal. It's all about division. It's not about uniting, but it uses the language of social justice and equality and love and freedom. It's saying that. They want free speech, but they don't want free speech for people that are saying things that they don't agree with. And so that is what is taking place. And so you will never be able to reach the church. You'll never be able to reach the university until you understand what they are saying, and you have to take it head on. So that uh, is what I came up with while I was sitting here listening. I don't know if we have time for the other part. <laughs> You actually still have seven minutes, seven okay, minutes and well then, 19 seconds. Go I'm going to give my, uh, my written presentation. Um, back in 1935, Albert Einstein denounced anti-Semitism in American academia. The more things change, the more they stay the same. He said, the hostile attitude of universities towards Jewish teaching staff and students has been increasingly perilously, even though it manifests in a genteel or hypocritical manner. Unfortunately, the current Jewish leaders do not comprehend the seriousness of the situation similar to the German Jews in the time of Hitler. They believe that they are able to put an end to the problem by being silent and disregarding it, and they thus miss the time for creating places of support. And so Einstein said this about the universities back in 1935. If you look uh, at today, when we're talking about anti-Semitism, there are a lot of Jews that are part of that movement. There are a lot of Jews that are in the BDS movement. There are a lot of Jews that are driving this. And so you have to discuss that too when you discuss what's taking place in academia. The U.S. State Department defines anti-Semitism as a certain perception of Jew, of Jew, which may be certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews, rhetorical, 
and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism that are directed against them or non-Jewish individuals, their property, their community institutions, their religious facilities. And it may manifest itself by targeting, as you know, the nation of Israel because it represents the collectivity of Jews. And uh, it blames Jews for whatever is going wrong in the world. It's the Jews. They have these conspiracies. They want to take over the world. The protocol of elders and all of these things. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it. Um, but you should know. Elites in academia, you're not going to go on a college campus and find a faculty member that's going to say, I hate Jews. You know, Jews are all these terrible things. They have a language to say these things without openly uh, expressing it. And so they don't openly uh, uh, condemn Jews. They do it in a very subtle way. And so it doesn't look the way that you might expect it would look. They don't joke about the Jewish physical appearances. Instead, the criticisms manifest themselves in, as anti-Zionism and in the BDS movement. And BDS stands for boycotts, disvestment, and sanctions against Israel. It, uh, it's a global movement. It stands, according to them, I'm reading from their website now, for freedom, justice, equality, for the Palestinian people and the American way and apple pie and all of this wonderful stuff. And so according to this narrative, Israel is an occupying and colonizing, uh, is occupying and colonizing Palestinian lands, discriminating against Palestinians, and we can't have any discrimination, right? <laughs> so that's what Israel is doing, against the citizens and denying poor Palestinian refugees the right to return home. I mean, that's bad, right? Right, right. right okay. Um, BDS was inspired by South Africa's anti-apartheid movement. It advocates pressure, techniques, and tactics to force, force Israel to obey the law. We want everyone to obey the law, right? Okay. Um, BDS emerged from a 2000 and one conference against racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance that took place in Durban, South Africa. And again, listen, it BDS, this boycott movement emerged from a conference organized against racism, we all against racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, intolerance, all of these bad things. And the movement is appealing to people because of, it's framed as social justice. And the church is ignorant. Social justice, the words, it sounds wonderful. Who, who would be against social justice? The people that embrace it don't understand that it's Marxism. And so they embrace it. And, um, and so that's one of the reasons that it has been attractive to people because it sounds good. The fruits of the movement has been a dramatic increase in anti-Semitic attacks. There's an organization that was founded in 2015. It has a tracker, the anti-Semitic tracker, uh, founded by two University of California professors. They have um, documented more than 3,000 incidents on college and university campuses since 2015 more than 3,000, and it's increasing rapidly. And so that's part of uh, the context. BDS and Students for Justice in Palestine, that was founded in 2000. These organizations are behind a lot of what's taking place on campus. And according to this um, anti-Semitic tracker, or track of anti-Semitism, it says that the BDS movement demonizes Israel with false charges of crimes against humanity, singles it out for abuse for ignoring the human rights abuses and intolerance against women and ethnic minorities and other religions in the Middle East, cutting off the heads of Christians, you know, boiling them in hot oil or uh, dropping them in cages in the ocean. That's disregarded. They're focused on Israel as being the abuser. So it's demonic, demonic. 
It's Marxism, it's critical theory. And so under the influence of this kind of hatred and ignorance, widespread ignorance, the same people who condemn Israel and are critical, they um, are people that they discriminate. They're not speaking out for the Jewish students and faculty and people that are being attacked, but they're criticizing white supremacy. They all worked up about white supremacy, yet they're doing something that is probably even more widespread than white supremacy. And President Trump, to his credit, uh, he passed an executive order, or he signed an executive order targeting college and university campuses uh, for their anti-Semitism towards Jewish students, and that was done you know, fairly recently. So it is a serious problem, but we can address it, but we have to understand it first. Thank you. Absolutely, and one of the campaigns that PJTN has been working on is the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, taking that executive order, putting legal um, context to it, and introducing it in state legislatures like Tennessee and Ohio this year. State of Florida, under Go Governor Ron DeSantis' leadership, has passed it, and so has the state of South Carolina. It's critically important that we call out these anti-Semites, that, um, that they be challenged, because the civil rights of the Jewish students on our college campuses is being threatened, their rights are not being protected. Now, my, our next panelist, Reverend Jeffrey Jemison, recognized as a leading voice of black leadership in Ohio and throughout America. He, um, his, he's, he's been involved in politics and ministry since his teens and his subsequent graduation from Moody Bible Institute in Ashland Theological Seminary. He was appointed the first chaplain of the Ohio Democratic Party in 2006 and served to build relationships in both the black and white communities as a bridge of leadership. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Reverend Jemison. <laughs> Reverend Jemison, we talked a little bit about South Africa and anti-Semitism and the apartheid movement. Your topic today is Martin Luther King and Zionism and the rise of anti-Semitism in the Christian African American community. How can we overcome? My question, what are three practical steps that we can take to counter this rise and bridge the gap between the two communities? Thank you, Lori, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, just quickly, and I'm going to uh, definitely remain uh, true to the 10 minutes given to me. Um, just a couple of things I want to add in terms of background. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm excited to be here, and I hope that uh, what I say, uh, what I leave you with is something that you can find practical, and maybe we can implement some of these things. But I do want to share this with my background. Uh, I am a publisher of the newspaper called the Ohio Life News. It's also found online. And I left some copies back on the table there for you. I'm here with my lovely wife, Lori, who is also a member of our show. We have, uh, one, she's one of the co-hosts of the Jeff, Lori, and Nick show, which is a conservative uh, radio talk show, which we're found on iHeartRadio and other platforms. Um, also, I need to share with you uh, much was said about my Democratic Party affiliation previously. Uh, when I did come to see the light, um, and find that a lot of the policies just did not work. Um, I did switch parties and I am on the executive committee of the largest county's Republican Party in Ohio, which is Cuyahoga County. Um, also, I'm the owner of, our, our family's been in the publishing business, marketing and PR since 1950, and I own a marketing and public relations firm uh, for the last almost 20 years. and. Uh, it's, We've helped hundreds of candidates, issues, and businesses uh, get their message out and get more customers and uh, get more publicity. Uh, the other thing is uh, I must give recognition to uh, our members. Uh, I pre I'm president of the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance of Ohio, and uh, we uh, are doing a number of things. So 
First of all, uh, thank you again, Lori. Um, dealing with MLK and Zionism, Dr. King, I would like to say, was of course known as a real fighter for civil rights, and he was also a fighter for the Jews. Now, sadly, in today's world, uh, much anti-Semitism comes from civil rights leaders and uh, leaders and activists uh, that have continued uh, fighting along those lines. And even in, sadly to say, even in the uh, African-American community, you know, they, a lot of the leaders have fought, forgotten how much Dr. King loved the Jewish people and they loved him. The scripture always just comes to mind. Uh, what greater love hath any man than that he lay his life down for his brother? Dr. King had that type of relationship with the Jewish commun community. So the, the topic, Martin Luther King and Zionism, specifically Zionism, it's one thing to love. And my sister here talked about um, social justice. It's love everybody and liberalism loves everybody. It's just about love everything and everybody, even things that are wrong. So, but Zionism, Dr. King um, said his dream, of course, of, of a post-racial society where people would be judged by the content of their character instead of the color of their skin. With, as it relates to Zionism, Dr. King made this statement. He said, when people criticize Zionists, they mean Jews. You're talking anti-Semitism. Those are two powerful sentences that Dr. King made. In other words, just think about that. When people criticize Zionists, they mean Jews. You're talking anti-Semitism. Those two um, sentences there really, really sum up his profound and unequivocal support for the nation of Israel. And that's where we are today. So Martin Luther King was, support, did support Zionism. Um, he loved Israel. And we look, we, so we talk about the rise of anti-Semitism in the Christian African, African American community. Well, let's look back. Um, when you look at the history of uh, blacks and Jews, and especially in New York City over the last half century. It's been a very complex uh, relationship. It's been somewhat complicated. And while it, you may, it might seem as though these two communities, uh, minority communities that were natural allies in the struggle for civil rights, because as we all know, there were Jews who, who marched and rabbis right alongside Dr. King during the 60s uh, with that great you look at the old, that, that great speech of, uh, we have a dream, I have a dream. Who was there with Dr. King? Jews, rabbis, hold, hand in hand. So this relationship has been somewhat complicated. How could it even um, come to this point now where it is today in New York City? That's just, as we just look at New York City. Well, it seems as though during the 1960s, um, these two allies found themselves on different sides of the struggle as it relates to the different issues, minor issues that, are, that um, sprung up during the 1960s. Conflicts over housing, the education system. Um, and, and it seemed as though Jews did leave some of those areas of the inner cities. And what happened, it left a void for other communities and, um, to come in. And whereas there were, this is a problem here, even today, where there were many Jewish businesses in the inner cities, uh, after they left, went to the suburbs and so forth, it left a lot of vacant properties, a lot of vacant businesses. And what happened were you, a lot of uh, Arab-owned businesses came in, which is the issue today. And it led to... Here's the other thing. You have Arab grocers, uh, gas station owners, and other businesses. And also you had a lot today, there, you have a lot of Asian businesses that have uh, taken up residence in inner cities. So what happens is you lose that personal 
uh, touch. And you don't have that face-to-face -face contact anymore that Jews had with uh, African Americans during the 60s and during the Civil Rights era where they were marching hand in hand. They just don't see each other daily. And I'm reminded of a friend who said this to me, and it was very profound, and it just kind of stuck with me. He said, you know what, it's hard to hate up close. So that's going to lead to the three questions that uh, uh, were asked. Uh, so these, what happened was when these conflicts over housing and education and other smaller issues uh, developed in the 60s and, and, and all the uh, protesting and marching and so forth that took place after Dr. King, it seemed as though Jews and African Americans found themselves on different sides especially as it related to economic issues. Remember, a lot of the Jews that owned the businesses continued to own their businesses, but they moved their businesses. So then a lot of African Americans did not have that uh, same mindset to own their businesses as in Greenwood uh, in South Carolina and so forth, and Tulsa, Oklahoma, where, there were, which, where we had these great models of uh, Black Wall Street. So. Here we have the tensions today, uh, tensions developed in New York between poor blacks, ultra-Orthodox Jews, and, and again, uh, what happened was it created misunderstandings between blacks and Jews on both sides. And then during the Crown Heights riots of 1991 where you had activists um, like Al Sharpton, for instance, took different positions and said different things. It kind of helped to incite uh, problems and divisions. And then that coupled with the identity politics that it seemed to, uh, that, that it gave rise to more identity politics with, which, which really helped to create walls between people, build walls and show the, and highlight differences between people. When in reality, we're all God's children. We're all one, one nation, and we, we should all seek um, to, to find common ground and love. Okay, so um, and today, it leads to today where surveys have shown that over the last quarter century, last quarter century, African Americans hold anti-Semitic views at a rate far higher than the rest of the population, and it's due to the lack of communication. Add this uh, to the Nation of Islam and its rhetoric, okay? Um, and then actual mosques being in black inner city communities, it's just somewhat softens, um, softens the walls of separation between the two groups. Um, now I'm speaking the two groups of African Americans and Muslims because they have their mosques in inner city communities. So, and they try to meet, uh, they attempt to meet with other African American clergy and, and, and shed their uh, positions. Okay. So it kind of softens the relationships, at least it, it creates some dialogue, even though um, black Christians, Christian leaders are very proud of their Judeo-Christian heritage and hold to it because of the biblical truths where God told us in the book of Genesis that I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you and God's chosen people are not forgotten but we were in, engrafted through Jesus Christ to be accepted into the vine, the true vine. So we're all God's people and we're all called by Jesus Christ into the family of God, okay? Jew, whether Jew or Gentile. And then the three, so um, also you add to this liberalism. We talked about uh, the 60s and 70s. We saw the lack of businesses, Jewish businesses, uh, leaving African-American communities and in inner cities. Um, Arab grocers in many inner city communities, they hired regular folks and when they hire family members of African Americans, 
that creates relationships and, 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 and you talk to Arabs and you talk to other, um, even Asians. So my point is when you don't have the Jewish businesses there, that also uh, led to some, demi some uh, lack of uh, uh, relationships, some led to the destruction of them. So then um, this also the social justice and liberalism versus God's standard. How do we overcome? And I'm going to wrap this up. Um, and there is reason for optimism. How do, it's number one, we wrap this, we, we overcome this by bringing people together, bringing leaders together, people of faith, faith leaders, for the purposes of information, uh, discussion. That's the first thing, we've got to talk. Jewish leaders, African American leaders have to come together and talk. Uh, secondly, I, I really believe we can overcome this through economic engagement. Um, I find that uh, as, conserv as a conservative, African American males are more uh, apt to listen to a message, a conservative message, when it has to do with building them up, giving them a sense of self-worth and freedom and economic empowerment. And I really believe that economic engagement in, can be done through business coaching, um, an empowerment series. Uh, speaking of economic empowerment and building up your own communities, taking control of your businesses in black communities. And I think that um, African American and Jews can collaborate and come up with, create these type of series that will um, that are beneficial to both. And while that's being done, of course, that's creating long-lasting uh, friendships and it, its engagement that's ongoing as opposed to a simple seminar or a one-day activity. And these are the type of things that we're going to push forward. Also, um, thirdly, educate. Back to the basics of scripture. Our, Educate African Americans about their God-given responsibility to embrace Israel, God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. Uh, and how do we do that? Through social media, um, through television, radio, um, and through, our, through a free press. And we utilize our newspaper, both hard copies and online, Ohio Life, Ohio and Midwest Life News. Um, you can look at our newspaper online, ohiolifenews.com. You can Google Jeff, Lori, and Nick show. We've interviewed Lori Cordoza Moore, and also we're going to continue to promote um, the belief, our position with Israel, and that we believe that all people, all Christians, African Americans, must uh, do their part to. Uh, extend an arm and a hand to build this relationship. Uh, thank you for this time, and uh, I yield back thank to Thank you, Lord. Reverend Jemison. <laughs> yes, I have had the privilege also of submitting op-ed pieces for Reverend Jemison to put in his publication as well. So talking about these issues from a biblical perspective. Our next panelist, Andrew Bostom, Dr. Andrew Bostom, he is author of the highly acclaimed books such as The Legacy of Jihad, Islamic Holy War, and The Fate of Non-Muslims and the Legacy of Islamic Anti-Semitism, From Sacred Text to Solemn History. Dr. Boston has had frequent articles posted in such national publications as The New York Times, The American Thinker, National Review Online, and The Washington Times. Please help me welcome Dr. Andrew Boston. Dr. Bostom, you're going to talk about the Islamic anti-Semitism, understanding the global pandemic of Muslim anti-Semitism today in its doctrinal and historical roots. My question for you is while Christian anti-Semitism and its theological roots are rather broadly acknowledged and condemned, is there Co comparable acknowledgement and condemnation of Islamic anti-Semitism and its theological origins. 
Islamic law, Sharia, per Quran 929, so the ninth surah or chapter, the 29th verse, mandates waiting jihad war to submit Jews and Christians to humiliating status of religious discrimination and legal inequality if they do not accept the true faith, i.e. Islam. And it reads, fight against those who believe not in Allah nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, Muhammad, and those who acknowledge not the religion of truth, Islam, among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya, the Quranic poll tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. But Islam also singles the Jews out uniquely for opprobrium, as is evident in the seventh verse of the Quran's first chapter called the Fatiha, or opening, which pious Muslims repeat 17 times daily. This verse refers to those who've incurred Allah's anger, and both the tradition of Islam's prophet Muhammad himself and over 13 centuries of authoritative Quranic commentaries till now maintain this reference is to the Jews. Why have they engendered Allah's anger? Here is a 1940 summary rationale by the great scholar of Islam's anti-Jewish polemic Moshe Perlman from a chapter entitled Jews in the Quran and Traditions, which interestingly mirrors a 1966 work by Muhammad Sayyid Tantawi modern Sunni Islam's greatest commentator and papal equivalent grand imam of Al-Azhar University, Sunni Islam's Vatican, from 1996 to 2010, also entitled Jews in the Quran and Traditions. So from Perlman in the Quran. The Jews transgressed Allah's commandments and flouted the prophets and even slew them. That's Quran 381. Therefore, many punishments fell upon them. That's Quran 261. For example, some of them were turned into apes for desecrating the Sabbath, Quran 265, 7166, Quran 560 claims apes and pigs. The believers, Muslims, will find that they, the Jews, are their fiercest enemies, that's Quran 582. Therefore, after they had rejected many friendly overtures, that's Quran 259 and 581, it was decided that they must be fought against, made tributaries, and compelled to pay the poll tax as a, ma as a mark of their humiliation, again, Quran 929 in the traditions of, uh, of Muhammad. They did not shrink from plotting, practicing sorcery, and poisoning, including Muhammad himself, until they were finally crushed and driven out of Arabia. The Jews extended their hatred of the prophet to all Muslims. They became, in a way, the incarnation of evil. No wonder that when the world comes to an end, and when Dajjal, the Muslim Antichrist equivalent, threatens to destroy those of the true faith, the Jews will be betrayed in their hiding places, even by the crying of the rock, here is a Jew behind me, kill him. The discrimination shared by Jews and Christians under deliberately abasing uh, Sharia mandates is what historian Batya Or called dimitude, which derives from Quran 929's Dimma Pact of Submission, which spared the lives of Jews and Christians who did not, to convert, who did not convert to Islam. She stated, for me as a Jew, this insight into Christian dimitude represented an intellectual experience that was not easy to undertake. This was not the domineering face of European Christendom, persecuting and triumphant, but the discovery of its persecuted, humiliated, and suffering other side. In short, Eastern Christianity's history of dimitude under Islam is a sort of Jewish experience endured this time by Christians. What was that Jewish experience, past as prologue, shaped by both the broader Islamic institution of dimitude and Islam's own unique canonical Islamic Jew hatred, derived from the Quran itself, the traditions of Islam's prophet Muhammad, the so-called Hadith, and the earliest pious Muslim bi biographies of Muhammad, or the Sira. Mythically tolerant Muslim Spain, Andalusia, before the Reconquista, in fact the land of continuous jihad with strip, strict application of the Sharia for both Christians and Jews, illustrates clearly the simultaneous Jewish experience of dimitude and theological Islamic Jew hatred. Moshe Perlman described how inflammatory rhetoric rooted in canonical Islam, including profuse usage of the Quranic epithet ape for Jews, declared according to the Sira by Muhammad himself before he slaughtered the surrendered males of the Medinan Jewish tribe Banu Qurayza, and the notion Jews had breached the Quranic Dimma Pact of Submission through their cunning precipitated the mass slaughter and destruction of the Jewish community in Grenada during a 1066 pogrom by rampaging mu Muslims. It is estimated that 4,000 Jews perished, annihilating the entire community and making it the largest anti-Jewish pogrom till then in European history. Eight decades later, the Jewish sage Maimonides barely survived the Berber Muslim Almohad Jihad ravages of Spain and North Africa, which slaughtered tens of thousands, forcibly converting the Jewish survivors to Islam 
and subjecting these forced Jewish converts to a Muslim inquisition, which lasted through the close of the 12th century. Maimonides, in his 1172 Epistle to the Jews of Yemen, who wrote to the sage as they were suffering from a wave of anti-Jewish pogroms and forced conversions to Islam, urged them to remain steadfast while lamenting, quote, the nation of Ishmael persecute us severely and devise ways to harm us and debase us. None has matched it in, in debasing and humiliating us. Today, the grotesque myth of Islamic tolerance of Jews in particular persists even as we are in the midst of a global pandemic of Muslim anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish violence. This violent hatred is driven by the same unreformed and unrepentant canonical Islamic themes Perlman described in the 1940s, which date to the advent of Islam, as promulgated now by Islam's most authoritative religious teaching institutions, Sunni and Shiite alike. Analyses from the Anti-Defamation League, published between 2014 to November 21st, 2019, so just this past November, which determined the prevalence, the occurrence, of extreme anti-Semitism, that is, agreement with at least six out of 11 anti-Semitic stereotypes have demonstrated all the following. The 16 most anti-Semitic countries in the world were, are all in the Muslim Middle East, where extreme anti-Semitism has a 74 to 93 percent prevalence. Extreme anti-Semitism is 50 to 55 percent prevalent among Western European Muslims, i.e., approximately threefold the rate of Western European Christians or non-Muslims overall. Extreme anti-Semitism in the U.S., a much more philo-Semitic country, has a 34 percent prevalence amongst Muslims, 2.4-fold the 14 percent rate in non-Muslims. This excess of Muslim Jew hatred is accompanied not only by endless jihad violence against Israeli Jews, so 450 to 500 thwarted attacks per year in 2018 and 2019, additionally thousands of rocket barrages, but three to tenfold increased rates of anti-Jewish violence or violent threats against Western European Jews by Muslims relative to violence from the left or right and 23 Muslim jihadist attacks against American Jews since 9-11, 16 of which were thwarted, thankfully, but seven that were completed, resulting in eight deaths and eight serious injuries, the most recent being Muslim convert Grafton Thomas's attack on a Muncie, New York synagogue, December 28, 2019, during a Hanukkah candlelighting ceremony. Current Al-Azhar University Grand Imam and Sunni Muslim papal equivalent, Ahmed al Tayeb during an October 2013 interview, reaffirmed authoritatively the canonical Islamic animus which fuels the global orgy of Muslim Jew hatred and violence. Riveting on Quran 582, al tayeb stated brazenly, a verse in the Quran explains the Muslims' relations with the Jews. See how we suffer today from global Zionism and Judaism. He equates them. Since the inception of Islam 1400 years ago, we have been suffering from Jewish and Zionist interference, he equates them, in Muslim affairs. The Quran, Quran 582, said it and history has proven it. You shall find the strongest among men in Edmony to the believers to be the Jews. 850 years ago, Maimonides stated with the understandable resignation of a subjugated Jewish dhimmi in Islamdom the following. We have done as our sages of blessed memory instructed us bearing the lies and absurdities of Ishmael. We listen, but remain silent. In spite of all this, we are not spared from the ferocity of their wickedness and their outbursts at any time. On the contrary, the more we suffer and choose to conciliate them, the more they choose to act belligerently toward us. It is unconscionable that today, due to sheer cowardice, Jewish and Christian leadership refuses to condemn the canonical Islamic Jew hatred proclaimed by Grand Imam al tayeb and thousands of lesser Muslim clerics worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bostom. Our next panelist, Reverend Dr. Tricia Miller, serving as Christian Research Analyst for the Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting in America, or also known as CAMERA, Dr. Miller is devoted to her passion of educating and equipping Christians to be activists for Israel and the Jewish people. Her much acclaimed book, Jews and Anti-Judaism in Esther and the Church, is considered a modern day handbook in exposing the theological and historical errors at the root of anti-Jewish Israel narratives. 
in today's global climate. Our topic today for Dr. Miller is anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, and anti-Zionism. How is the church influencing this unbiblical union today? Dr. Miller, my question for you is, in what way are Christian leaders who claim they are pro-Israel actually opening the door for error that will result in evangelicals turning away from biblically-based support for Israel? Thank you, Lori. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really an honor to be here, and I've enjoyed the comments of everybody else on the panel. Um, there's two ways that I want to talk today about how the church is influencing and also encouraging these three things, anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, anti-Zionism. First, I want to define the terms, just to explain why we're putting these three words together. Anti-Semitism is the opposition to Jews on the basis of ethnicity. I think we all get that. I just want to make it clear, because it'll be more clear in a minute why. This includes dehumanizing and delegitimizing and dehumanizing Jews. Anti-Judaism is defined as the opposition to or persecution of Jews based on their religion. So this includes denying Jews the right to exist in terms of their own self-understanding. Well, today, anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism are alive and well under the cover of the new term anti-Zionism and the politically correct form to be anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish is to be anti-Zion. Anti-Zionism is opposition to Zionism, which is nothing more than a movement in support of the existence of a Jewish state. So anti-Zionism is against the Jewish people's right to self-determination. So that's, that's the anti-Semitic connection. And then the anti-Jewish connection is anti-Zionism is opposed to one of the original, one of the foundational identifications of Judaism, which is the centrality of the land, the importance of the land to the Jewish people. So that's how it's um, anti-Zionism is, is really equivalent. And in my book on anti-Judaism and Esther, I, I make this connection very clearly. There's really no line between anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, anti-Zionism. It's extremely troubling that in the last few decades, under the guise of anti-Zionism, substantial parts of the organized church have succumbed once again to the millennia-old practice of delegitimizing, demonizing, and dehumanizing Jews. But what's most alarming in recent years is that those who identify as evangelicals, the members of Christendom who have historically been supportive of Israel, they've been targeted with a false pro-Palestinian anti-Israel narrative that's specifically designed to turn traditional supporters of Israel away from that support in favor of the Palestinian political narrative. And through this effort, parts of the church have definitely become involved, and I'm speaking specifically now of the evangelical church, they become involved in influencing and encouraging anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, anti-Zionism. There's a number of ways this has happened, but I'm just gonna talk about two. The first one is very overt. We've already mentioned it several times, replacement theology. Simply, replacement theology is the belief that Christians and the church have replaced Jews and Israel in the purposes of God. This originated with the early church fathers just a century or two after the time of Jesus. And according to this belief, since the coming of Jesus, Jews don't have any role to play anymore in the purposes of God. Therefore, there's no reason for their continued existence. So you can see how this is a foundational foundation of anti-Semitism. And this theological position cannot exist without the delegitimization and demonization of Jews. So it results in overt anti-Semitism. And this, the logical conclusion of the belief that there's no reason for the continued existence of the Jewish people is the result that a Jewish state doesn't have a right to exist. There again, the connection to anti-Zionism. Well, some Palestinian Christian theologians have adapted replacement theology to make it serve the Palestinian political agenda, which denies the right of Jews to live in their historic, their biblical homeland. And in order to do this, these Palestinian theologians promote the false claim 
that Palestinians are the indigenous people of the land and that Jews never lived there until a couple of hundred years ago. The logical conclusion of the claim that there were no Jews in the land until the last couple hundred years is the identification of Jesus as a Palestinian. After all, how could Jesus be Jewish if there weren't any Jews there when he was born? Every Christian in this room who reads their Bible knows that in order to identify Jesus as a Palestinian, you have to do great violence to everything the Bible says about the identity and the historical context of Jesus. You have to rewrite or ignore large portions of scripture, and that's exactly what the Palestinian Christians do to promote this belief, to promote their political cause that denies Jews the right to live in this land. The second way that the church influences and encourages all three of these things, anti-Judaism, anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, it's more subtle, but it's at least as dangerous. In this case, this unbiblical union is strengthened through the promotion of confusion of facts, both historic and facts on the ground in relation to Israel's existence as a Jewish state. Confusion rules when facts concerning the history of the peoples of the land that's now the state of Israel, they're distorted and narratives are used that omit history and context and those narratives are presented as authoritative. This distortion and omission of historical facts and context plays right into the Palestinian political agenda that's based on rewritten history. And in the case of the Palestinians, it's based on the unbiblical assertion that Jesus was a Palestinian. Unfortunately, the failure to acknowledge historic realities and facts on the ground has become some of the talking points and the education provided by some organizations that claim to be Christian, they claim to be pro-Israel, and they claim to be a force for peacemaking in the Middle East. In their effort to play a role in achieving peace between Israelis and Palestinians, they present what's going on in the Arab-Israeli conflict as an equal struggle between two equally valid national movements. In the process of trying to present these two narratives as equally valid, actual historical realities and facts on the ground are omitted or distorted. And what is happening between Jews and Palestinians is presented as a tragic conflict between two peoples who unfortunately lay claim to one land. As part of the attempt to make it sound like the ongoing conflict is an equal struggle between two equally valid national movements, nothing is said about how many times Israel has made tremendous concessions in the quest for peace. Nothing is said about how the Palestinians, and before them, the Arab world, continue to refuse to acknowledge Israel's right to exist. Nothing is said about the repeated refusal on the part of the Arab world, and since the 1960s, the Palestinian leadership, to accept any offer of peace, no matter how much Israel offers. There's been some really good offers. They're always refused. Nothing is said about what Hamas and the Palestinian Authority say in their charters, which clearly state their intent to destroy the Jewish state. Nothing is said about the ongoing incitement on the part of Palestinian Authority to murder Jews and how the PA pays people to kill Jews. Instead, in the attempt to present the conflict as an equal struggle between two equally valid national movements, there's an insidious narrative created that ignores and reinterprets history and facts on the ground. The end result is that Palestinians are presented as innocent victims and Israelis are the illegal oppressors who have no right to take action to, present, to protect their people from attempted murder. Nothing could be further from the truth. Omission and distortion of facts and context for the purpose of creating a false account is egregious when anyone does it. It results in confusion. But when this is done by Christian leaders who claim to be pro-Israel and they claim to want to be a force for peacemaking in the Middle East, it's even more egregious. Furthermore, 
this so-called peacemaking that employs this technique is actually counterproductive in terms of arriving at the goals these Christian peacemakers claim they want to achieve. This is because the apparent acceptance of the distortion and omission of facts in the Palestinian narrative demonstrates a tolerant attitude towards the Palestinian authorities' demonization of Jews and their hatred of Israel and of the Jewish state. So this apparent acceptance of the narrative gives the Palestinian Authority hope, gives them hope that they're going to succeed in their agenda to gain possession of all the land from the river to the sea without having to recognize Israel's right to exist, without having to accept any compromise for the sake of peace. So this results in the complete unwillingness to negotiate that we witness historically and to this day among the Palestinian leadership to any attempt to broker peace. Through these misguided efforts, these so-called Christian peacemakers are actually doing more harm than good. So they're in effect advancing the Palestinian cause, which is rooted in anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, and anti-Zionism. As Christian journalists and as Christian leaders, all of us here, we need to make sure that we are doing nothing to aid and abet the church in influencing and encouraging this very unbiblical union. This union that is validating the delegitimization, the demonization, the dehumanization of the Jewish people. Instead, we need to stand firmly on the facts and counter the confusion that results when distorted and biased narratives by we need to remain grounded in the truth, which is really the only true path to peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Our next panelist, Dexter Van Zyl, currently serving as, cam as a media analyst for camera also. Dexter Van Zyl is credited as one of the world's most knowledgeable analysts on Christian anti-Israelism and anti-Semitism. Anti His studied commentary has been lauded in national and international publications such as the Boston Globe, the Jerusalem Post, and the Alga Minor. Today, Dexter, Dexter Van Zyl's topic is gonna be modern Christian anti-Semitism how are Christian leaders influencing anti-Semitism today? Please join me in welcoming Dexter Van Zyl. So my question for you, Dexter, what can we do about the Christians who use their influence to promote anti-Semitism? Okay. For approximately 60 years after the Nazis and their helpers killed two-thirds of the Jews living in Europe and started a war that killed upwards of 60 million people, Anti-Semitism was a discredited ideology, particularly in the United States. Europe, well, I don't know. Mainstream media outlets may not have done such a good job of covering Israel in the United States, but at least they didn't give anti-Semites too much of a sympathetic hearing. Sometimes they got some headway, but for the most part, the, the big three head, uh, networks and the major market dailies, the newspapers, treated anti-Semites as crazies who needed to be kept in check. Anti-Semites were always present on the fringes, but most of them had a tough time accessing larger audiences. Every once in a while, one of them would sneak into the mainstream, but then somebody like Bill Buckley would say, no, you're out, and they would kick him out of uh, National Review. Unfortunately, those days are over. Now anybody with a web camera can connect with thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of fans on the internet, and they can also solicit donations from their supporters. And sadly enough, two of the worst examples of this phenomenon are Christians. Uh, one example is a Christian news organization called True News, led by Rick Wiles. And I first ran into True News at the 2018 Christ at the Checkpoint Conference in Bethlehem, an anti-Israel event organized by Palestinian Christians, most of them affiliated with Bethlehem Bible College. And I've been to five of those conferences over the years. Uh, I, I need more Valium as, as I come back from all of those. But uh, I don't take Valium, but I still need it. <laughs> Conference organizers gave True News the run of the place, and during the conference, Wiles told his viewers that Israeli Jewish rabbis are just like Judas looking for a political savior who will rule a political kingdom on earth, a super race that will dominate the planet. That's really what Zionism is all about. And he also declared that if Jesus himself walked the streets of Jerusalem again, they would release Barabbas and they would crucify Jesus. Nothing has changed. 
And the thing is, is that YouTube, uh, they basically discredited themselves and they were kicked off of YouTube. But that's only going to add to the organization's credibility amongst its hardcore followers. The fact is, is the organization has a critical mass of followers so that it will support the organization's ministry for years to come. And they're going to follow Wiles and True News to other platforms. And that brings a, a, a problem. You know, on one hand, it seems like a reasonable thing that you want to deplatform people, but at the same time, it incites their base. Mm -hmm. For example, one person who has come to the defense of True News is a Catholic anti Semite uh, by the name of E. Michael Jones. And uh, like Rick Wiles, he's been able to use internet technology to broadcast his hate uh, to. Uh, a large number of disaffected young men here in the United States. And one of the things that, that uh, Lori asked about what do we do, and I think is, is that one of the things that we have to do is we have to figure out a way to get to those angry young men before uh, Rick Wiles and E. Michael Jones do. That's really what it comes down to, and as evangelists, that's your calling. And. Uh, one of the things that E. Michael Jones does is he goes around telling people that the Jews are essentially the source of every problem in the world. And the thing is, is that if you're a young, disaffected young man who's had a tough time making his way into the world, kind of like, uh, you know, the, the men who came back from uh, World War I in Germany, well, that's a pretty good story to buy into. Now, the thing is, is that Bishop Kevin Rhodes, who serves the diocese where Jones lives and worships, has come out against Jones's rants in a statement that was issued last week. Uh, but the thing is, is that even E. Michael Jones is going to say, look, they got to him too. Because any time the Jewish community or the pro-Israel community is successful in basically challenging this anti-Semitism in an administrative way or something like that, they'll say, look, the Jews control everything. And so what happens is, is that I think on one hand, deplatforming these people may in fact be a reasonable thing to do, but then even at the same time, there's another part of me that says that maybe it's counterproductive, because when they get deplatformed, Wiles and Jones, uh, they can and will say, look at what those Zionists have done, uh, and they are undermining our democracy and our right to free speech. And this brings me to another part of the story that I'm here to tell, is, is that Christian peacemaking organizations have regularly promoted this very notion that somehow the Jews control the media or the, the discourse in the United States in an unhealthy way. And one of the things they do is they point to the success against the BDS campaign. When states pass laws opposing BDS, what it does is it feeds into the narrative that the Jews control everything, and what it does is that it gives them more uh, an ability to whip up their base. It grieves me to say this, that, but uh, so-called Christian peacemakers have been in the primary facilitators and enablers of anti-Semitism in the West and have been for the past few decades, and Dr. Miller talked about this. What happens is, is that they affirm the Palestinian vendetta narrative against Israel. And I use the word vendetta consciously because it appears in the Palestinian national anthem. And it doesn't compare very well with the Israel national anthem, which you know is t entitled, most of you know, is the hope in Hebrew. Organizations such as the World Council of Churches, Churches for Middle East Peace, and those are the two people that I've been writing about most recently, they affirm basically this grievance and vendetta narrative put forth by Palestinian elites and translate it and soften it for Western ears. And they sand off explicit anti-Semitism and leave, but they leave the overall grievance and vendetta narrative intact. And they promote self-determination for the Palestinians, whose elites have denied the Jewish right to self-determination time and time again. And that's really one of the interesting things. I've been reading Harry Jaffa's book, Crisis of a House Divided, and another book that he wrote, uh, uh, I can't remember, I've got him probably right here behind me, uh, Birth of a New Freedom. And one of the things that Abraham Lincoln said and, and was is that, look, if you think that you can lay claim to the rights enunciated in the uh, Declaration of Independence and own slaves at the same time, you're basically contradicting it. And the same logic applies to Palestinian statehood. If the Palestinians are going to lay claim to the right of self-determination, they have to acknowledge uh, j the Jewish right to self-determination. And every peacemaker has a, an absolute obligation to keep reminding the Palestinians of that reality. And um, 
And the thing is, is that you cannot logically affirm the narrative and then be taken seriously when you condemn anti-Semitism. And that's really one of the things that, that, that is most troublesome. So why am I talking about World Council of Churches and Churches for Middle East Peace in the same breath as Rick Wiles and E. Michael Jones? Because these groups prepared the way for these haters. Both Wiles and Jones lifted their talking points about Israel from the progressive pro-Palestinian Christian peace movement. So what do we do? Well, this is what I think. Christianity presents its followers with a choice. We can join our suffering with that of Christ on the cross, embrace the demands of forgiveness, or we can align our own personal grievances and our own rage with the vendetta narrative of the mob. And the thing is, is that this is really the question that we have to present to followers of Jesus. Are you gonna align your suffering with that of Christ or are you going to align or combine your rage with the mob that put Christ on the cross? And the thing is, is that you can't claim to support human rights when you align your activism with the interest of a political movement that demands the right of self-determination while denying it to the Jewish people. And you can't affirm, even in an oblique way, the, the, uh, the soundness of the Palestinian vendetta narrative against Israel and claim to promote peace and forgiveness in the Holy Land. And so I think that's really what we need to do is just to keep hammer away on that message. Thank you. Thank you, Dexter. Our next and final panelists, Rabbi Jonathan Hausman, lecturing nationally and internationally, Rabbi Hausman regularly is engaged to brief legislators on national security and foreign policy issues on agenda regarding Israel, Jewish continuity, and the existential dangers in world Jewry in the current global climate. He serves in spiritual leadership at Ahava Torah Congregation in Stoughton, Massachusetts. Please join me in welcoming Rabbi Jonathan Hausman. So Rabbi Hausman, your topic today is the unification of Jews and Christians is this historic and is it biblical? Now, my question, what do you think is the cause of the burgeoning of evangelical interest and support of Israel and the Jewish people and of the deepening in some circles of evangelical Jewish dialogue and relations? Uh, <clears throat> Thank you all very much. Uh, as uh, many of you know, this is not my first time down here with PJTN. Uh, but I think it's my 12th no. time, as a matter of fact. So, Lori, before I start, I have a question for you. It's, it's 4.13. How much time do I practically have? <laughs> uh, you actually have 9 minutes and 38 seconds. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. You, you know, everyone, I, I sat down to put together, gather some thoughts for today, and I came up with a five-page paper. Um, and as I was listening to my fellow speakers, I now have pieces of paper with notes. In addition to those five, you know, whoever said, oh boy, yeah, you're really in for it, okay? And he's available so, for interviews afterwards. Yeah, so uh, what was originally supposed to be very directed might seem a bit disjointed. And I have to begin, since I am a pulpit rabbi and I am a reformed attorney, okay, it means that I can't order from a menu in 10 minutes. Um, it also means that I get to change the, uh, the questions and how I want to answer. So I, I need to respond to something that one of my fellow speakers all the way at the other end had said, and I don't know, remember if it was Dr. Swain or Dr. Alfonsi or, um, or um, Jan Markle, and, and it's this. Um, yeah, my colleagues in the pulpit have abdicated a lot of their responsibilities. They have. For the reasons I don't know. It could be cowardice, it could be lack of education, although one would think that you reach this stage, um, you are highly educated. Though as my father used to say, you can have somebody who graduated from Harvard still doesn't know how to tie his shoes. You, you know, you do what I do, and if you're in the pulpit, you have to discuss issues that matter. And if you don't, 
get on the next boat out of town. And as I said to a friend of mine who's a former military and used to be in the government, I only have one issue. I'm a one issue guy. The safety and security of the Jewish people in the state of Israel. I don't care about anything else. I don't care who I embarrass. I don't care who I offend. I don't care if that's even my mother-in-law. That's the issue. So what ends up happening when I go out on my speaking junkets, um, which are few and far between these days, the question becomes in my pulpit, you know, Rabbi, you're going to, uh, like the other day, all right, proclaiming justice to this, oh, Rabbi, we remember Glory Cardoza Moore coming up to the synagogue. You know, is, is it really kosher to accept their support? That's really what it boils down to. And it causes lots of Jews to scratch their head, well, in my case, scratch my, scratch my scalp. Because you have this growing phenomenon of Christian support, evangelical Christian support, that has many American Jews perplexed. And they ask questions. And what's the question that's asked? Is this subterfuge? Is there something else behind this? Is there a missionary impulse? And I've been doing this 20 years evangelical Jewish dialogue. I mean, Dr. Swain and I have been on panels together back in the day. A long time ago at Vandy, as a matter of fact. And, and after 20 years of doing this, you, you know, listen, I understand where a lot of these Jews are coming from. But fact of the matter is, Here's where it comes from. These people, including my rabbinic colleagues, a majority of my rabbinic colleagues are, and, and Dr. Boston and I have spoken about this too, they are so divorced from Jewish tradition, and they are so divorced from Jewish practice, they're divorced from a grand knowledge of Jewish history, facility with Jewish texts, that they have no historical context when it comes to this kind of conversation, completely. What they are informed with is liberal political sensibilities. And that has absolutely nothing to do with the pulpit. If you're a rabbi, your job is to make sure that Jews understand that being Jewish is the most grateful gift that God can give you. And if that's the case, you cannot marginalize Christian Zionists because, Lori, that's what you are and that's what you are. But concomitantly, you have to know who sits across the table. So I have colleagues, fortunately I, I can say none of my students at the synagogue because they know I would kill them. <laughs> they don't sit across the table. I, I mean, they, they don't know who's sitting across the table in interfaith dialogue. You need to know. If you're sitting across the table with somebody who supports BDS, as my 24-year-old would say, what in the hell are you doing? If you preach acceptance of revisionist Palestinian narrative that denies Jewish historical claims, why are you sitting with that person? It makes no sense. Absolutely makes no sense. And that goes whether you're sitting in a synagogue or whether you're sitting here at the NRB. You have to do your homework. Absolutely have to do your homework. Amen. Thank you. I'll take that. <laughs> so where does this come from? Where does this leave us? Since I probably got two minutes right now. Three. Three. <laughs> if you find people who accept the validity of Jewish belief, in Jewish practice, in Jewish history, who understand as I teach my congregants to read the Bible critically, 
And I'm talking about my Bible, not your Bible. The 24 books that make up my Bible, read it critically. And if you as a Christian, read your Bible critically. I think you'll find Jewish resonance in what you read in the New Testament. Because it's all there. Including bold and bald statements that God's covenant with the Jewish people is irrevocable and has never been broken and can never be broken. And if God breaks his covenant with the Jewish people, okay, what does that mean for you as a Christian? You're right. You're done for. Because if God can break one promise, God can break another promise. It's as simple as that. And I think that's what has led to this moment with what's happening in certain segments of the Christian world to reach out hands to those of us who are, I mean, my kid says I'm a thumper of a Jew. And she's right. Absolutely right. Is it a new era? I don't know. Is it messianic? That's not my field. Is it something unique? Absolutely. And I just want to end with this. If it weren't unique, then explain to me how a small synagogue in Stoughton, Massachusetts, and it's pronounced Stoughton, by the way. We're named after the Governor William Stoughton, the hanging judge of the Salem Witch Trials. <laughs> we are American history. They don't teach American history anymore. Sacco and Vanzetti came from my town. Okay. Explain to me how a small synagogue in a nondescript town in the bowels of Massachusetts hosts a pro-Israel evangelical church. And we do. And we have for four years. Something's happening. I don't know what. But as my father used to say, son, God tied the knot at the end of the rope. Hold on, because it's going to be a wild ride. <laughs> I thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Before we open up for uh, some Q&A, you know, as I listened to each of the speakers and they shared with us, it brought to my remembrance a scripture I want to close my portion with before we move to questions. And that's out of the book of Luke, chapter one. We talked about our biblical responsibility. We heard from all of our speakers, derive that point home as Christians. And the authenticity and the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that it is eternal or irrevocable. But in the book of Luke, chapter one, I want you to hear something. This is so important for you to hear and I pray you might even hear it for the first time with new ears. It says, this is under Zacharias' prophecy. Luke chapter one, starting in verse 68. The word says, blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies. Who is Zacharias talking about? Israel. Who is he prophesying that he's going to be saved from? Israel's enemies. And from the hand, listen to this, of all who hate us. Anti-Semitism, ladies and gentlemen, it's right here in the New Testament scriptures to perform the mercy 
promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Father Abraham to grant us, Israel, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. This is Zacharias' prophecy, that they would be able to worship God in spirit and in truth without, what? Without fear. Today, if you ask someone Jewish, if they feel afraid, what do you think they're gonna tell you? Oh no, we live in America, we're safe. <laughs> this is prophecy. This is the word of God. And this is the promise that he made to them. And it is our responsibility, because it is in our end of the book, declared and proclaimed that we are to protect our Jewish brethren so that they can worship God without fear. <laughs>